So this is Blaze. Uh, we're here on 12, 30, 20, the last day of the 365. And uh, I have the honor of being with Dr. Woods who's put several of those 365s into a certain pro project. We're out here in Long Beach and she's going to do a little introductory and I can hardly wait. Thank you so much, Blaze. You know, as I reflect on this year, it has been a tremendous uh, undertaking to direct a statewide project to try to understand the issues, concerns, and cares of people of African ancestry related to mental issues. It's a very serious, very serious topic and many of our people have not been accustomed to expressing those things that are inside of them. So this project has given them an opportunity to share their voices, to open up, and to seek for a better understanding of how to deal with some of those things that are plaguing them, that they do not feel comfortable with, and uh, oftentimes do not know where to go to find resources. Los Angeles County Department of Mental Health is the largest mental health jurisdiction in the United States. There's over 700 plus contractors. My goals are to see that more implementation is used with consumers that are turned in to contributors and they're actually allowed to go through as the recovery model states with them in control of their recovery process. That means that you have to do things that are not done. You have to use a com utilize a common sense principle. And this is hard to integrate in a system that has already been able to create barriers, deaf ears, blind eyes. This is not the time for anything less than the best treatment utilizations of community service providers that are outside of the network they have to be utilized, they have to be integrated, you have to actually meet the needs of meeting your brother or sister in a better, more friendly, a caring, a compassionate manner because it should be a situation where it's not a handout but a hand up and it has to be tailor-made because the current planning is not really sufficient to actually meet the needs of a community that has bleeding hearts, many bleeding hearts and what I found out there are so many individuals that go into the system that have been into the system for multi-generational one, two, three generations. This is something I want looked at because how do you rehabilitate a community that has already been almost defeated? They have empirical data that individuals in the system could lose 20 years of their life. How do you regain that time frame from going in seeking help from an organization that has the bone structure of being the place to go but the inner structure is still missing items and services that were, de that were designated from the New Freedom Commissions Act in 1996, from 94 to 96. And my biggest concern is when consumers are at the point of now going out to do better in their life, they're attached to the Department of Rehabilitation. There's been no study on how that's devastating consumers. It's not a cookie cutter situation, but a lot of consumers I have found out have actually been sent back into a form of trauma and they're having to live their life traumatized by in the system because they don't really have the ancillary providers to provide them services in a timely and a reasoning, reasonable manner. So I'm hoping that new services that are comparable to African Americans' well-being from a generational standpoint, they can be developed and implemented. So the California Reducing Disparities Project has been an effort to understand better the issues related to mental uh, health, specifically regarding prevention and early intervention. What is it that people of African ancestry, people who are living in America black, irrespective of their nationality, what is it that we need in order to better um, be balanced, healthy, whole people. They need to treat me nice. They need to uh, respect me. They need to, uh, to get the help that I need. And they need to help the people are homeless 
are on the street because there was a young lady needed some help and I tried to point her in a direction but that was me out there. And then I'm confused, don't know any better. They just need they need to just get all the people that have mental issues. They get the help that they need. And there's no bad that they scared of us. <laughs> they like they scared of us. So they think we may pull some on them. What makes you think? that they are afraid of you. How do they act or what do they well, say to make you Well, one they that? call me, uh, you look retarded. Who, who called you that? Who said that to you? It, um, supposedly my godmama. She called me crazy. And she said, you ain't no good. You, uh, you have mental issues. Cause you hit myself in the head. Right here. Mm -hmm. Take my hand on. Mm -hmm. You know. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Do that and I get mad mm -hmm. because I can't hurt that person, I hurt myself. Mm -hmm. The banging that goes on, sometimes it's in our environment, sometimes people feel it in their head, mm -hmm. sometimes they feel it in their heart, and they don't know what to do. They don't know where to go or who to seek for uh, to assist them with that. And certainly some people feel like, am I losing it? Um, is it that maybe I'm not quite balanced in my head? Am I weird? Am I crazy? Or what? When people start having those types of thoughts, and basically many people have those um, ideas to float across them every now and then, it doesn't mean that there is something wrong with you, but it may mean that you need to talk to somebody about that. It's hard because sometimes I do um, I see a lot of them out there talking to yourself, and I look and say, was that me one time? Mm -hmm. Yes, that was me at one time. Um, my, my name is Sharon Yates, and I'm on the board of directors with uh, NAMI um, Urban Los Angeles. And um, we have a program that's, uh, in addition to our peer-to-peer program that we have. We have a family support group. We teach classes on uh, families to family members on how to care for um, someone that suffers from mental illness. And there's a real um, value in having the parents and siblings support the family member that, that suffers because we know firsthand what is going on, what the triggers are, how the medications are going to react or not react. And we have a vested interest in our loved one. For people of African ancestry, we have a lot in which we are having to deal with on an everyday basis. The California Reducing Disparities Project was funded by the Department of Mental Health so that ethnic populations would have an opportunity to um, identify from their perspective how they view the world, how they understand what's going on inside of them, and also what do they need in order to stay mentally healthy and balanced. And this is a tremendous opportunity for people to be able to express those thoughts and their own voices and to share with listening ears and we at the African American Health Institute and along with our collaborative partners have undertaken this mon monumental task so that we could go statewide to hear in the voices of our people those things that they believe would help them have good mental health. Did you forget where you were? Uh, support groups. We were talking about support groups and you had asked how how best would this new Mental Health Services Act um, be helpful. I think with the families. I think the families really need to, are, need to be and are an integral part in the recovery. My daughter developed bipolar disorder when she was 13 and she's now 24. And um, we've got her at a point now where she's semi-independent 
Um, she's uh, in a program through a group called Step Up on Second, and she's now living in a group home, which is her first experience with the group home. They use the uh, Project Return uh, peer support methodology, and it's really working for her. Um, I think that in conjunction with the families and then the, of course the doctors and the uh, medications and other treatment options uh, make a well-rounded person and a recovered person. They, they take advantage of muscle. They take advantage of us. Who they takes advantage of you? The, as they call, unquote, regular people. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> Mm -hmm. Regular people take advantage. Cause they think we talk to ourselves and oh yes, you answer yourself, I ain't crazy. But you talk to them and you crazy. And I see it every day. Cause sometimes I be like, you know, I I be doing this all day. All day. This is my habit. All day. I just all day suck my thumb. Turn on my thumbs or answer yourself. Uh huh. And sometimes you hear voices. And I do hear voices. And sometimes I need a vacation. My vacation is, is to the psych ward. I miss going in there. Mm -hmm. And people want to understand it. Call me retarded. My kids don't respect me. You know? But that's life. Life goes on. So all year long, the year 2011, and also the year 2010, for two years we have worked on this particular project. And for two years we've collected data. We've uh, tried to be available in communities and in homes and um, in places where people meet and places where they gather so that they could be relaxed and be comfortable. And today, the last day of 2011, we're in Long Beach. Today we're going to hear from their perspective what they understand and believe would be important for them in order to have good mental health what could have happened or taken place or intervened in their lives in order for them not to come down with a certain mental issue. And you'll hear in their own voices and you'll understand from their own perspective. And it's been a tremendous journey for people to uh, travel this road. And it's a tremendous relief to know that other people care. And that the Mental Health Service Act the funds that have been provided under this particular act will provide resources and a system that is more responsive to the needs of the black population. It's hard though. Mm -hmm. Sometimes, you know, you be in the house by yourself and start crying. And sometimes I feel like that sometimes. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But I didn't want to tell him that. Mm -hmm. Because you don't know, know how he react mm -hmm. towards you. Mm -hmm. You know, people look at me different though, they really do. So with this particular video, we wanted to allow people to express in their own voices those practices, those recommendations, those issues, those concerns, and ways in which they could have prevented conditions and what could be in place to intervene early for not only themselves but also for other people. People who are dealing with stigma, dealing with shame, dealing with a uh, lack of, of attachment to an environment and a society that values them. So let's talk about various aspects of recovery. I guess there's different degrees. I mean, mental illness is like the word love. is so subjective. It can mean so many different things to so many different people. Okay, for me, recovery means, uh, for my daughter, I'm speaking for a person, in my mind, what a bipolar rapid person with rapid cycling, what recovery would mean to them, would mean that they were able to keep their outbursts under control especially in public, 
that they have a public face and a private face and they know the difference between the two milestones in your recovery a milestone where you're like man I'm getting better well um, the medications that, uh, that, that are taken you know can help um, reduce some of that uh, difference between the person who's bipolar and know that that uh, that they can uh, function better with the medication uh, even at home or in public. Mm -hmm. uh, a point where you felt like well I'm getting better. To me recovery was feeling better about myself and feeling like I was able to meet the challenge of an everyday life and feel more independent of having to depend on services that were given to me through the hospital. I actually am getting better. I was, I had been hospitalized in a long, long time by the grace of God. He was there, my strength and my hope. And I tried to hold my sanity down by, um, by praying, going to church, talking to people that know what I'm going through. That's how I get over my um my diagnosis and stuff like that. Thank you. Okay. So in other words, when you're feeling a little down, you know where to go. Yes. So at a time when you felt like, well, you know, I'm getting a grip on this. My name is Sharon Lyle, and I felt like I could handle my situation. I was about 40 years of age. <coughs> When I realized that I am more than a diagnosis, I am more than someone else's limitations. And what I decided at that moment was to not allow myself to be subjected to another person's limitations. I can move beyond perceived limitations. I need assistance. I'm legally blind. I suffer from a condition called keratoconus. I'm deaf on one side. It was from an aneurysm approximately 12 years ago. I've dealt with issues on a multi-generational basis. I have strong family ties. I'm a great, great aunt. And my adventure into the mental health system, I started into that process because I found out there were different behaviors that I didn't want to deal with myself. So when I went in, I was seeking help. I wanted answers. I looked for information. I received a lot of literature. I did a lot of re reading. And when I started the reading, I found out that after fighting, file, file, after following their guidelines, the system really is broken. It doesn't really allow for individuals to take control, even though it is a recovery model. It's been limited for some consumers. I have just challenged it on every aspect because I do know me. But getting in a place where the Department of Mental Health actually respects consumers and elevates consumers to a point of they can transcend from consumers to contributors, it's not quite there. I continue my advocacy on a systematic basis because I'm allowing consumers to meet the needs that they are aware of and I'm trying to educate service providers and administration that individuals that suffer from mental illness, they're not completely stupid, they're not without vision, they don't lack, lack courage, they're survivors and you have to treat survivors in a manner of how they work well with the world. Hopefully, in the next 10 years as I look into the future, we should have less visits to the emergency room where people come in in crisis. We should have less long-term stay in medical facilities as well as uh, mental health facilities. We should have less children being taken to detention and less children on on medications that are not intended for long-term therapy. Psychotropic drugs that really should be given with caution to adults. We should have a thriving California where people are quantum leaps above the current status quo. Less depression, less suicide, less loneliness. We should have a society where people 
are productive and feeling their optimal best. That's what I'm hoping in the next five years and ten years. And you've mentioned several times that throughout your experience in life, people have disrespected you unnecessarily just by looking at you. Uh, how do you deal with that? Well, how do I deal with them? Look at them, keep smiling, God bless you, keep on stepping. I'm going to end with that. That's powerful. Okay, bye. Thank you.